Welcome to Sage for H and another Science of the Times episode. Today I have the honor to speak to Valentin Joitner, professor in international law at Lund University. We are going to focus on the ongoing Israel-Hamas war and how to make sense of the conflict using international law. What is international law? How does international law apply? Is it a genocide? And so on and so on. Uh, but before we start, please, Valentin, uh, tell us a little bit about your academic background and very welcome. Thank you very much, John, mm. for the invitation. I'm happy mm. to be here and talk about this uh, important, concerning uh, topic. Um, yes, as you mentioned, I'm an international lawyer here in uh, Lund and teach and research international law, um, including questions related to the law of war that we're going to look at today. And I'm happy that we can, yeah, look at some of those questions and hopefully get a little bit of clarity on, on these questions that are often discussed, but not always maybe from an international legal point of view. Perfect. Uh, all right, so then let's start with the very basic question. First of all, what is international law? Yes, international law is many things, but primarily, it is that law that governs the relations between states. It also governs relations between other entities that are not states, like international organizations or sometimes companies uh, or even um, ordinary individuals. But primarily, international law is law made by states for states. And it is primarily states who are the addressees of it, as in who must comply with it. And um, there are a few sources from which international law derives. So if you want to find out where international law uh, comes from or what it says on specific questions, you would look at its sources. And there are two that are most crucial for most questions and for our purposes today. The first source are treaties or conventions as they are sometimes called. These are written agreements uh, between states uh, normally uh, that regulate how states want to solve a certain question. So if you want to um, agree on a boundary, for example, between Norway and Sweden or Denmark and Germany, you can do that by means of a written agreement where you say this is where the boundary will be. The second source that is uh, very important is customary international law. So this is um, law that emerges from the practice of states. It's not a written law, uh, but it is a law that you can deduce by observing how states do things. Uh, and you always, if you want to establish a customary norm, you need two things. You need to have a certain number of states that do something. For example, a certain number of states that claims a certain part of their seas, uh, the seas that are connected to the territory as their own national territories. If every, if you can show every state claims 10 miles of their uh, seas as their own, then you could say maybe there's a customary norm that 10 miles is uh, sovereign territory of those states. And then you also need to show that the states claim or make these claims um, with the intention to make a legal claim. So you cannot just study habits, you need to study behavior that states engage in believing that they are bound to do so. So those are the two important sources. Mm. And uh, yeah. Mm. Thank you very much. I, I like that uh, by states for states. Uh, it makes it clear that it's not by states for individuals necessarily, or by states for uh, some other entity perhaps, uh, or some other group, uh, but it's by states for states. Uh, yeah. Yes, primarily yeah. at least. Yeah. We, there yeah. are of course also human rights treaties, but I think mm -hmm. um, it is important to remember that it is the states who make these laws and that it's not um, a world democracy where everyone gets a vote on how international law looks like. States, even when protecting civilians in situations of armed conflict, they would make rules that ultimately favor the interests of those states. Yeah not necessarily the interest of the civilians. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Uh, thank you very much for that um, answer. 
Uh, all right, so let us continue. What is the international law of war? Yes, the international law of war is a sub discipline of international law. International law as a whole covers all kinds of things, space, environment, uh, animals, um, many economic questions, but also um, the way in which states use force. And there are within the subgroup of international law, two more subdivisions or one more subdivision into two more groups. Um, the first uh, group of questions concerns situations in which states are at all allowed to use force. This is what is strictly speaking called the law of war or the use ad bellum, use ad bellum, the right to war, to, to fight at all. And the second cluster of questions, the second grouping is sometimes called law of armed conflict or international humanitarian law, it's the same thing. And this regulates, uh, this part of international law regulates how, if a state is using force, the state must use that force, regardless of the question, and this is very important, whether or not the state is actually allowed to use force. So those two parts of the law of war are completely separate. Mm -hmm. Everyone has to comply with the second part, even those who have the right to use force or those who do not have the right to use force. Mm. Okay, so uh, when can force be used? If we focus on use ad bellum, when can force be used? Yeah, so if we, exactly, if we start focusing on that first cluster of questions, mm. yeah. there are a few exceptions, but the most important one nowadays and for our purposes today is self-defense. So international law in general, ordinarily, prohibits the use of force. And use of force just is a, is a more technical term for what we might otherwise call also war. But the use of force, uh, force can, can also be other things uh, other than war. So any kind of use of force is prohibited in accordance with Article 24 of the UN Charter, um, but Article 51 of that very same Charter allows states to use force when they defend themselves uh, under five circumstances or in, in, if, if five conditions are met. Um, the first condition uh, is that this right needs to be invoked by a state. So uh, Skåne, where we are in the south of Sweden, doesn't have the right, or Greenpeace, or IKEA, um, uh, or us as universities, we don't have that right. You need to be a state. Uh, second, uh, if you are a state, you need to be able to establish that an armed attack occurred. So you must have been attacked first, or an attack must have been imminent in some way to different mm -hmm. degrees. And thirdly, that attack conventionally must have been carried out by another state or by an actor whose acts can be attributed to another state. We will see maybe later on that this is a criterion that has has been redefined a little bit in recent years, but the starting point used to be uh, the right needs to be invoked by a state in response to an armed attack carried out by another state. And then two more criteria. The first one, you have to be able to show that the force you're using is necessary to bring that attack to an end. So if there's another way of bringing an attack to an end by diplomatic means, or maybe because it's obvious that this is a one-off, um, then it will be difficult to establish that the force was necessary to use. So that also means you cannot use force to punish someone or revenge someone always has to be linked to the self-defense attack. Uh, and the fifth criterion is that the force you're using must be proportionate. So even where it might be necessary to repel, for example, an army from your territory by force, one has to do that in a way that doesn't do more than is necessary in order to um, repel that army. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I even here in these criteria, we hear the state-centric nature of international law. Um, and uh, you mentioned developments. Uh, I mean, in many ways of looking at the world, we have gone beyond a state-centric world. And after the attacks on September 11, 
some things must must have happened with the war on terrorism and the United States claim to self-defense against the Taliban. And uh, in the conflict today in Israel, we have Hamas, uh, whose uh, status is a bit unclear, but we could consider Hamas perhaps a non-state actor. Uh, but maybe not. I don't know. It depends. Uh, so uh, could you clarify that? Uh, has there been any development since uh, September 11 and the war on terrorism? Yes, exactly. So with mm. respect to this uh, third step that you have to show that you were attacked by a state, um, after 9-11, it um, seemed to be the case that most, or was the case, that most states, or the overwhelming majority of states, uh, were um, in support of the American claim that they could use force in self-defense against Al-Qaeda, even though Al-Qaeda was a non-state actor. Okay, so it wasn't the Taliban specifically, they said they mentioned Al-Qaeda, yeah, maybe as a global network. Yeah, it depends yeah. on the specific attacks mm. that they carried out, but mm. Al-Qaeda was um, primarily the, the most obvious agent mm entity that carried out the attacks and then the argument from the United States point of view would have been with respect to the attack on Afghanistan that the Taliban um, were harboring yeah. either or didn't do um, enough to uh, take them out themselves. Yeah, yeah. So after 9-11 this has shifted and after the 7th of October we could see the same happen uh, that the overwhelming majority of states from all parts of um, the globe supported Israel in its claim uh, or invocation of the Article 51 right to self-defense with respect to um, Hamas, even though Hamas is a non-state actor. But maybe uh, we, we could have a look at what happened on the 7th of October. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah we can do that. Yeah. Uh, what about self-defense and Hamas? That would be nice. Yeah. Uh, so we so can I clarify thought, that. Yeah, yeah. because we could... Um, I thought we could apply now these criteria uh, yeah. to what happened on the 7th of October. And when, when one speaks about the 7th of October, it's very important, of course, to keep in mind that um, the conflict or whatever Hamas did on the 7th of October, it didn't conclude on the 7th of October. Mm. There are in many ways ongoing, uh, there's ongoing fighting also from Hamas. Mm. Uh, and there are also still the hostages, for example, that we come to later, maybe. Mm. Um, so we are, we're using now 7th of October as an example, but uh, it's important to keep in mind that much has happened since and the fighting continues. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we would argue, or if one wanted to argue that Hamas could invoke this right to self-defense, the first thing they would have to establish is that they are a state. And uh, that is going to be difficult because... Hamas is not a state, it's an, um, a non-state organization, it's a terror organization. Um, and there is no other state that has claimed the attacks that Hamas has carried out for itself. That would have been possible. Uh, one it would have been possible for um, the internationally recognized representatives of the Palestinians um, to claim what Hamas has done as its own acts. And then at least for those who um, accept that Palestine is a state, then that first step could have been taken. Uh, but this is not what happened. So Hamas is not a state. And for that reason, it cannot avail itself of this public international law, this international law, um, self-defense right. There might be other bases for, for arguing about self-defense, but we talk strictly speaking about international law, uh, that's not going to be possible. The second criterion, um, and, and this is enough to kind of actually dispose of the claim, but for completeness sake, we could have a look at the, the other criteria. Mm -hmm. The second one was that you have to show that there was an armed attack. And the question here would be if the unlawful occupation of the Palestinian territories would have constituted an armed attack of sufficient gravity to trigger this right to self-defense if Hamas were a state. And um, there are many who would argue that the unlawful occupation um, amounts to an armed attack. It's a grievous, um, serious, very violent infringement of the rights of a Palestinian state, if it is a state. Um, but there are others who would say 
uh, this is not how self-defense ought to be interpreted. You need to have a concrete, acute attack, not a general state of affairs that is unlawful and very violent. But one could argue about this armed attack having existed. And this is another, I think, very important point to keep in mind that even though uh, self-defense is not available as an argument to the Hamas side in order to justify the use of force, it is not the case that on the 6th of October, um, we had a situation in Gaza that was in compliance with international law. In fact, we had a situation in Gaza, uh, as in the uh, fact that it um, is occupied or that Israel controls what comes in and out um, is a state of um, uh, unlawfulness. So that's important to remember. But at the same time, it doesn't trigger under international law as conventionally interpreted the right to use force. If one would go further down through these criteria to the third one, is the attack carried out by another state? If the occupation uh, counts as an attack, it would be because Israel is a state and then you would come to the necessary and proportionate criteria. And here, um, it would again be tricky to establish that these are met, because you would have to show that um, there is no other alternative available to uh, the, the Hamas uh, fighters uh, who carried out the attack uh, to respond to the occupation, if that is an attack. Uh, and some might argue, um, but there are other ways in which this situation could have been solved or can be solved. Um, and the last criterion is the this proportionality question. So is, in light of the occupation, the use of force that was used on the 7th of October um, proportionate to, uh, to that attack um, that might be the occupation? Mm. Uh, and that, that is going to, and we are not talking, this is very important to remember, we are not, not talking about the way in which the force is used, that civilians were targeted and um, the festival uh, attendees were, were killed and so on. That, that, of course, is also unlawful. But here we are looking only at the question, may force be used at all? Mm, mm. Uh, and there, with respect to the necessity requirement and the proportionality requirement, it um, would probably be difficult to establish it. It depends. All of this depends, and I will probably say this uh, a lot of times to come, it depends a lot on which facts one takes for granted, uh, not just um, actual empirical facts, but also certain legal facts. If one, for example, accepts that Gaza was or is occupied or not. Um, the Israeli government would dispute that Gaza is occupied. They would claim that they have withdrawn from Gaza and that they are just controlling the outer parameters of the territory. Many others would say, if you control every person and every object and every drop of water that, uh, and medicine that comes in and out of a territory, you do for all intents and purposes uh, occupy it even if you have no boots on the ground uh, you have uh, drones on top yeah so this is what it would mean for hamas it, okay. it yeah the, the use of force for yeah. hamas at the right is not available under okay. conventional international law okay but if we turn it around and look at uh, israel instead yeah if we look at israel hmm. um and here the same counts you you have to um ask this question repeatedly and for as long as the use of force is ongoing. So it's not just about what happened on the 8th or 9th of October, but about what, what's happening every day now in the area. So if Israel wants to claim is uh, self-defense, which of course they do, uh, they would have to establish the first criterion that they are a state, which is not disputed, uh, and that an armed attack occurred, in this case on the 7th of October. This is also not disputed. It's, it's very clearly the case uh, that Israel as a state was um, attacked. And um, then we come to the third criterion, that attack was carried out by a non-state actor. But as I mentioned after 9-11 and also in light of the reaction of states um, on the 7th and 8th and 9th of October, um, it seems to be accepted uh, that Israel is entitled to exercise this right to self-defense, even though Hamas is a non-state actor. And then you have to show that the force that you're using is necessary 
to repel the attack and that it's proportionate. So if you have a situation like uh, we saw on the 7th of October, you have foreign fighters uh, on your own territory in civilian uh, installations, um, it's very plausible uh, that the only way to repel this attack is by the use of force. And there, there is in that situation, no other plausible means to um, repel uh, those attackers. And then you also have to show that the force, that using force is proportionate um, and to uh, proportionate to the force used by the other side. Mm. And it seems based on the facts that um, we have that on in those early days, um, both of those criteria were met so that Israel is entitled to use force. Mm. But as I said, you have to then, um, once this attack on the 7th had been repelled and uh, the fence to Gaza had been repaired uh, and the blockade had been imposed, the question then becomes, with respect to the continued use of force, whether those criteria can still be established. Hmm. That can change from today to tomorrow. It can change with respect to different attacks. Uh, so this is a question you have, you have to keep asking all the time. Hmm. Okay, so you, you, you can never stop asking that question. It needs to be reevaluated. Okay, uh, before we go in, uh, or before we continue and focus on use in Bello, uh, which I think is uh, what uh, many in the world are focusing when they see the horrendous attacks and the, the, yeah, the horrendous situation on the ground with so many people suffering and, and Gaza that is totally devastated and bombed to the ground almost. Uh, that is, I would say, in many cases, a use in bello question. Um, uh, but before we uh, continue with that, I just want to uh, ask about um, uh, the thing you mentioned. Uh, you say that it's generally accepted that uh, Israel has a right to self-defense against a non-state actor. And these developments then are related to the uh, developments that occurred after the 9-11 and the uh, self-defense against um, uh, Al-Qaeda. So the thing is, the codification of international law is the same. Uh, so here we have uh, a new interpretation, a new convention, right? Correct. Yeah, I wouldn't say con. Yes, convention in a in a conventional sense, not in a legal. <laughs> in a legal sense, it means written agreement. But yes, we have a yeah. new yeah. custom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, sorry, I'm, I was actually not referring to convention. We have a new uh, custom. Sorry, we have a new custom. So this is part of customary international law because the codification remains the same. If I'm correct. Uh, but uh, if we now can say that states have a right to self-defense uh, against non-state actors, that is a new custom, right? Correct? Uh, yes. Um, yes. The convention, so the original Article 51 hasn't changed, mm -hmm. but it also didn't specify or doesn't specify uh, from where an attack must originate in order to trigger the right. Okay, so, so this state element is not in the convention. Oh, exactly. So it's not that the custom goes against the written letter ah, okay. of the treaty. It's just that often rights or principles that are codified are then further specified or further defined mm. by state practice. Okay, so the state practice, the customary international law, the state practice in this case. Uh, how do you know what is uh, the accepted mm -hmm. custom? I mean, because it's not in a written document, uh, or maybe there are many different written documents all over the world uh, that you then have to collect yeah. somehow. How do you specify what the custom is? Yeah, it, this is one of the difficult empirical questions in international mm. law. If you're very lucky, uh, you have uh, an international court, like the International Court of Justice, state that this rule is, must now be accepted as a part of customary international law. Um, but there are also other bodies of the UN, for example, the International Law Commission or academics um, who take stock of state practice. Mm. And, and that literally means you count statements. So you go to the websites of all the foreign ministries of the world 
and you check how these different ministries position themselves mm. in response to a specific situation. And from that, you then can distill, if you're lucky, um, some kind of um, principle or some kind of customary norm. Mm. But it is uh, not easy and there's no set formula. The only thing we know is uh, we need to have a, a nearly universal state practice uh, so many states who do it, and uh, we have to have the state practice alongside a belief that that practice is required by law. So mm -hmm. that states don't just do it because they always do it, but they don't feel obliged to do it. Uh, but they do it because they feel uh, that this is what the law requires of them. Mm, I see. I see. Uh, all right. Thank you for that uh, clarification. Um... Okay, so how must force be used? The use in bello question. Yeah. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, that I mean, if you just watch the news and if you're not a lawyer, if you uh, like me, you you don't know too much about the specifics about international law. Uh, it just seems that I mean, for the general observer, that the international law is blatantly violated every day. But uh, maybe it's not. Yeah, I, I'm, I would say in defense of international law that most laws or many laws are blatantly violated. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, with respect to inter the international humanitarian law, mm. we have in principle two norms, uh, mm. the, many more, but the, the key provisions, um, and we find them in custom and in domestic law, but also in the Geneva Conventions, for example. So if one talks about the Geneva Conventions, mm. uh, there are many of them, um, but the Geneva Conventions as a set uh, are about the use in bello, so the, the way in which you use force, mm -hmm. regardless of whether you are allowed to use it or not. And the two principles that we get from this body of law mm. are first the principle of distinction, which provides that you must distinguish uh, as a party that fights between civilians and uh, combatants uh, and civilian infrastructure and uh, military infrastructure. So you have, to, you have to distinguish between them. You cannot just blanket or carpet um, attack mm -hmm. another uh, people or state. And the second principle is the principle of proportionality. And this is now... Um, a different kind of proportionality to the one um, that we encountered before. Here, the proportionality must be established between the particular military objective that you are attempting to achieve and uh, the, the cost uh, that you incur in terms of collateral damage, uh, in terms of um, causing loss to life and injury. So you have to balance those two against each other. Um, that might mean in practice, if you have a military objective um, that wants to prevent, um, or rather that, that one, if, if you have a very high value target, a very important commander, and that commander is surrounded by civilians, uh, the commander's family, for example, or children or um, passers-by, then if, uh, if this is a very important person and there's the, the military advantage you would gain by taking out that person, uh, that would potentially mean that an attack on this person is proportionate, mm. even though it uh, leads to a large loss of civilian lives. And here, John, we have such a moment where you can see the state interest shine through. The mm. state has an interest in this military objective and that it is 100, 200, 300 civilians who um, sacrifice their life, that, that is just a price that um, the state is happy for them to pay. It's not the state who pays the price. No. It's the innocent civilians who pay the price, who donate their life to the military objective of the attacker. Yeah. So collateral damage, in other words, is okay. It's within the bounds of the law. Yes, if it is collateral damage, if it's so, if it is proportionate, yeah, um, and um, any attempt has been made to reduce it, and people have been warned, for example, mm. uh, and uh, so if if all of those norms have been complied with, it can be the case that even large civilian loss of life can be lawful. Yeah. So yeah. Mm, all right. 
uh, and the principle of distinction would then say that uh, a blockade of Gaza, for instance, we saw a blockade uh, by Israel when they blocked, I mean, I think everything uh, uh, from coming into Gaza at one point. Uh, yeah. That must be completely illegal. <laughs> Um, yes, so the principle of distinction has been violated, um, it, it seems at least very likely, and with respect to some questions it's indisputable, uh, since the 7th of October, on both sides. It was uh, uh, very obviously violated when Hamas attacked uh, civilians, not by chance or alongside military objectives on the 7th of October, but they, as we have seen, and red uh, intentionally targeted civilians yeah, even yeah. in the open field when there was no military objective around so that is clearly yeah. um, violating this principle of distinction mm -hmm. and it's it's also disproportionate by definition because there was no military objective there's no military objective behind killing uh, innocent uh, festival goers Hmm. So, with respect to Hamas, it's it's really a non-issue. With respect to Israel, it is slightly more complicated um, and very fact-dependent, and it's a huge problem for that reason that it is so fact-dependent that it is impossible at the moment, and more or less impossible since the seventh of October for for independent observers to gain access to Gaza. It's not entirely impossible. There are some, of course, UN agencies on site and private actors. Um, but for journalists, for fact-finding missions, it's extremely difficult to actually know what is going on. In most uh, sites, uh, like the Al-Shifa Hospital or now the tunnels in Lebanon that are being presented to the world are presented by the Israeli army, which doesn't mean that it is uh, not um, trustworthy, but it it still means that it is one party to this conflict uh, that controls uh, the um, places one can access and the information one can access. Mm. So with respect to most attacks that we've seen uh, on Gaza from the Israeli side since the 7th of October, it is a factional, factual analysis that is from um, abroad or from from so as removed as we are difficult to evaluate. But there are some where it is very clear, uh, nonetheless, uh, or where we have enough facts to conclude that um, these principles were violated, which means that war crimes were committed. One is the blo blockade that you mentioned that was imposed on the 9th of October, um, which hits and affects everyone without distinction. Exactly. 100%. And, and since this was openly announced. I, I think I have the quote here from the Minister of Defense, Yoav Galant. He said, I've ordered a complete siege on the Gaza Strip. Uh, no electricity, no food, no fuel, everything's closed. So he says it mm. himself. Yeah. So for that reason, and, and we know that this is not disputed, it's very easy to conclude this was a war crime, or, or is a war crime um, which violates the principle of distinction and, and cannot be justified based on proportionality. What I might stray now, uh, mm -hmm. but yeah. I don't think I stray too much because I think the use of drones and AI is occurring in uh, Palestine mm -hmm. and in Gaza. Uh, what about the principle of distinction? Uh, and we have an AI tasked to distinguish between civilians and combatants uh, and then and drone execute uh, the attack uh, completely uh, using artificial intelligence. Is that something that is discussed uh, in the field? Uh, have you have you heard anything about that? Have you read anything about that? Have you studied anything about that? Yes, it's being discussed a lot mm. um, by many different people, many in different stakeholders also. There, there have also been suggestions to have a digital Geneva Convention so rules about how to use force in cyberspace. Uh, this is now not what we are dealing with here because we are using uh, AI in, um, in the real world in some way, or you're using AI as a tool to execute conventional kind of strikes. Okay. By default, there is not necessarily something unlawful about a situation where this distinction, if it is carried out correctly, 
um, is carried out by, by a technology or AI. Often AI is very good actually at distinguishing civilians and uh, combatants. The, the question is more um, how to draw the line between a justifiable collateral damage as in a justifiable number of people being killed uh, and, um, and a disproportionate number of people being killed. And that is a, a, that's a judgment that needs to be made mm. that also needs to be reviewable. Mm. And if you have an AI make that judgment automatically, it could be the case that that judgment is not reviewable mm. in the same way that it could uh, be reviewed if a human makes it. Mm. But if it is the situation where the AI produces imagery um, and calculates and collates the numbers of people that might die, and then there's a human operator that then makes the judgment call or a legal advisor who says in light of these numbers, this is permissible, this is not permissible, then the use of AI is not as such a legal problem at the moment. Mm, I see. Yeah. But still, just the way that you talk now in exemplifying these matters is really a, a game of leviathans. I mean, how many civilians can die? How many can we justifiably kill? Uh, how, may, how much collateral damage is okay? It's like, even though it is within the realm of international law, it's a, it's a game of leviathans. So it's like, a, <laughs> yeah. It, it, yeah, it's... It's brutal. Yeah, yeah. It's another instance where it's good that we remember made by states for states. Mm. It's also important to remember that international law, like most other law, if not all law, it is something people willed into existence. Yeah, and yeah. as an international lawyer who communicates international law to you now, I am, um, it is my professional duty to relay the law to you as it stands. But it is also important to remember that it could look different. Mm. So this is not God-given. It's not derived from nature like uh, natural laws are. Uh, this is something that people thought is a good way of dealing with war. Mm. And if we disagree with that, mm. um, we should try to change it. Um, at least we shouldn't just accept it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right, you mentioned the example of the blockade, you mentioned um, the principles of distinction and proportionality, uh, and you exemplified uh, uh, with collateral damage and a few other examples. Is there anything that we have forgotten in relation to this? Uh, anything else that you feel that uh, we could say? We are back. Uh, oh, you, your internet connection... Uh, is unstable, or maybe mine is unstable. I don't know. But, but we're, I, back. I, I, we're back. Okay, I lost you there for a second. <laughs> no. Yeah. No is, is, have we missed anything? Anything else you would like to add to this, or or, or is this enough? No. Yeah. No. I think it's good to say uh, mm. to, to remember these two mm. principles: distinction, proportionality, yeah. and international law um, tolerates a very high number of civilian death. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so in some sense, we shouldn't necessarily put our, uh, which people sometimes do, our moral hopes and aspirations on international law. Because sometimes world opinion, the people, uh, they are looking at the United Nations and international law uh, for some moral guidance or they are, yeah, it is in some sense the hope uh, of mankind. Uh, but uh, we tend to get disappointed every time because we might expect too much from international law, actually. Yeah, I think mm. international law is not perfect. Um, but I think as a whole, it, it, it is justified to place our, our hopes a little bit in, in it and also the United Nations. We see it now in particular that it's so important to have um, institutions that are uh, bipartisan or that are removed from from the state level, uh, but mm. also a language. Mm. And international law at least gives us a language of talking about these things, mm -hmm. um, which even though there are certain parts of that vocabulary mm. that we might find problematic, mm. um, 
that it's not um, worth giving up on the language as such. Hmm. I see. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, what about the question of genocide? Yes. Um, the question of genocide is a, a matter of dispute at the moment before the Internet, International Court of Justice between South Africa and Israel. And what that case is about is the allegation from South Africa's point of view that Israel is committing genocide in, um, in Gaza. And what one needs to know about this case, maybe the most important uh, thing about it, is that in order to establish a genocide, you need to prove both that acts were committed um, that could be genocidal or that are genocidal, um, and that these acts were accompanied by the intention to commit genocide. The acts uh, of genocide are many, but an example is to, to kill people of a certain group, uh, or to harm them in very severe uh, kind of ways, or to transfer them from one part to another part uh, of territory. But with respect to the facts, there is no question that what we have seen transpire in Gaza since the 7th of October meets the actus reus, the act itself of genocide. But uh, the actus reus of genocide is often met. I mean, any, even collateral damage in a way is 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 that act uh, because you killed someone. As soon as you killed someone, you take that first box. But what makes a genocide and elevates it in some way to that more severe level is the intent to destroy in whole or in part uh, a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. So you have to intend to destroy in whole or in part. In whole and in part means even if you kill one person with the intent to destroy the whole group, you don't get to the whole group, it still is already genocide. So the numbers are not important. You could argue Hamas committed genocide on the 7th of October um, with respect to situations where uh, Israelis were killed because they were Israelis or because they were Jews. If only two were killed or three or one, um, then genocide could arguably have been committed. Uh, but the intent means either you find um, an explicit statement where you have someone who says, I killed you because you were German or Jewish or Swedish or a Muslim or Jew. Um, or you have to construct it. So you have to infer it. And there's a, uh, this is a very high bar. Uh, it's not entirely settled what that standard is, but we have indications from other uh, international tribunals that um, you can only establish that a state intended to commit genocide if um, that inference you're drawing from a set of facts, if the state doesn't say it explicitly, if that inference is the only reasonable inference you can draw based on the facts. So that means if there's any alternative that is um, a reasonable alternative, so a plausible alternative to why a state is killing people uh, or transferring them, then it will be difficult to establish genocide. The international legal community is, I think, divided on this matter. Many would say um, there are many reasonable explanations for Israel doing what it does. They would say there's no question that war crimes are committed, um, but there's also not enough evidence to support that they intend to um, commit a genocide. Others would say, um, based on some of the statements of some Israeli decision makers, including very high level decision makers, um, like the Minister of the Defense or the President of the country, um, or some of the videos that we have seen, um, which um, seem to suggest that here clearly the intent is to eradicate a people. Um, or the, the Minister um, of the Israeli government that I think is recently as last week said he wants to resettle Gaza. So that clearly implies there's an intent to clear the space. Yeah. Yeah. This is what this entire case is about. Is there intention or not? Mm. 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 Uh, you say the international community is divided. Uh, you don't have to have an opinion yourself. And, and if you don't want to share it, that is fine. But what, what, is, what is your uh, expert opinion on this? I think my 
the, the, yeah, the most important opinion that I have in res in this regard is that it whether or not it is a genocide is not the most crucial question. Um, it may be, it might may not be. I, I'm not in possession of the facts that I would need um, to be in order to make an authoritative pronouncement on it. Um, but I do think that it is a question that is of a lot of symbolic importance. But from my point of view, it is enough in some way to establish that war crimes are being committed. And that's much easier. Mm, that is not and for the people who are being killed, it makes no difference if they're being killed as part of a genocidal campaign or if they're being killed as unlawful uh, collateral damage. Um, they are dead. And the killing that we see must stop. And the unlawful um, attacks that we see from uh, Israel, also still from uh, Hezbollah and from Hamas uh, and others, uh, they must stop. So that's, as an international lawyer, that's my primary concern, to bring about a situation of compliance with international law. And how we then label the violations of international law is, of course, important, but it's of a less pressing concern to me right now, especially because I don't have the facts um, with respect to the genocide question. Yeah, if you just look at the facts that um, um, South Africa collected and collated, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just the basic ones that uh, you could see uh, in the ICJ, uh, including all the videos that they showed and so on. I mean, it's uh, up from relatively low levels uh, in government up to the highest levels. Uh, military representatives, Netanyahu himself, uh, soldiers on the ground. Uh, I mean, talking about uh, this in terms of genocidal language. Um, and we also have the uh, Old Testament reference to Amalek, for instance, uh, which is uh, uh, also used uh, from time to time. We see uh, soldiers dancing and chanting uh, these songs as well. Uh, clearly, uh, hearing the message from the top, so to speak. Uh, wouldn't that be evidence enough? I, I, I would agree that there's mm. a lot of evidence that suggests that genocidal intent exists, and also that it's beyond doubt uh, that there are representatives of the Israeli government that hold that view. Mm. But if you can establish it for the respective military missions as a whole, Mm. impute that or attribute that intent to the decision makers that actually ultimately make those decisions, that is a separate and complicated question. Mm, but I do think it is for the reasons that South Africa also mentions, or in mm. light of the evidence they presented, mm. I don't think it is a case, as some argue, uh, that is ludicrous or pointless or clearly nonsensical. I think we have enough information and, and the International Court of Justice agreed mm -hmm. uh, that it is worth looking very seriously at the situation. Mm -hmm. so, um, I don't want to in any way um, undermine or call into question um, the, the case as such. I mm -hmm. think it's excellent that we have 15 um, or 17 International Court of Justice judges that can have a look at the situation and uh, figure it out. Mm, yeah, great. Uh, what about uh, Netanyahu and the ICC? Yeah, that's the other forum where now international law with respect to this area can be enforced. And um, the the current state of affairs is that there have been um, that the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court in The Hague has applied for arrest warrants to be issued. Um, both for the Israeli government or leadership of the Israeli government and the Hamas leadership also. Um, these warrants are pending, so they haven't been issued yet. Um, they've been pending for a long time. Um, many think for a time much longer than expected. Um, but what it means is if they were issued uh, those arrest warrants, um, those people listed on them, including Netanyahu, uh, would be uh, would need to be arrested if they 
travel to a state that has um, accepted the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. Hmm. Yeah. And that's a personal warrant against yeah. individual people. Hmm. Hmm. Um, what about the ICJ advisory opinion about the Israeli yeah. occupation that came out 2024 or this yeah. year? Yes, um, that is the, the third kind of venue where these questions were, or questions related to this subject matter were discussed. This was an advisory opinion um, which was requested uh, long before the 7th of October mm. by the General Assembly. And what an advisory opinion is, is a set of questions, uh, or a request for an advisory opinion is a set of questions to the court. So it's like you call your lawyer to get legal advice, even if there is no concrete case at hand. Mm. Um, and in this case, the questions that were posed to the court related to the legality of Israel's activities in the occupied West Bank. So mm -hmm. these questions were not about Gaza. Uh, they were about the West Bank and Eastern Jerusalem, uh, which is also occupied. And the opinion of the court came out now in July. Um, I would recommend anyone who's interested in these questions to read it. They are relatively, they are available online for free and they are relatively excessively written. Mm. Um, but one could maybe say that there were four key findings from that opinion, four key observations. Um, one, that the occupation um, that has been in place since 1967 of those Palestinian territories is unlawful as such, so that the, the occupation, the control that Israel exercises over the Palestinian territories is unlawful. This was kind of clear to most international lawyers before this advisory opinion, but it's good to have the International Court of Justice confirm that this occupation as such is unlawful. It's unusual also because occupation is normally neither lawful or unlawful. It's just a state of effect, a state of affairs uh, that is brought about by military necessity in a kind of military conflict situation. But now we know the occupation specifically in the Palestinian territories is unlawful. The second finding is that the occupation in parts amounts to annexation. That means the state doesn't administer another territories or another entities, another state's territory as an occupier, but it treats that territory as its own. So it does away with the division between the original state and the occupied territory. And annexation is unlawful under international law. There's no question about it. There's no excuse for annexation. The third thing the court noted was that certain practices of the Israeli state um, in the Palestinian territories amount to racial segregation or apartheid. Um, so that they have put in place a policy um, with respect to taxation, for example, or zoning, or where you can live, or um, uh, what kind of uh, privileges and rights you have, uh, that distinguish between people on the basis of race. Um, and that is also unlawful under international law. And lastly, and surprisingly also to many international legal observers, the court has said that the Palestinians um, whose rights were violated since 1967 by Israel are entitled to compensation, to mm. damages. And that is monumental because if you think about the time that has passed since 67 and the countless and ongoing human rights violations and also violations of international law that have occurred since then in varying intensity, um, this means that the, the state of Israel is confronted with an enormous amount of um, compensation demands. Uh, it's a different question whether they will ever be enforced, but for an international court to say these rights uh, or the, the people whose rights were um, violated, they have a right to compensation, uh, that, that was quite remarkable. Another thing maybe, John, if we still have a short moment that I should mention is that mm. the opinion talks about Israel, 
but it also talks about the obligations of other states mm. um, not to be complicit in upholding a state of affairs that is unlawful under international law. So this advisory opinion is also communicating to states um, that they have an obligation, other states like Sweden, England, Germany, America, China, um, they have an obligation not to do anything that aids or assists Israel in upholding um, the state of affairs. Mm. And this is quite important. Um, it's maybe even more important uh, mm. Than, mm. than the obligations of Israel itself. Yeah. yeah interesting. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and we can find it. It's uh, readily available online, I guess. Yeah. Maybe we mm. can put it in the description. Yeah. yeah, we can put it in the description <laughs> notes. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Uh, let's do that. Um, I have uh, one last question or two. I will ask uh, one last question as well. But I just want to uh, ask something about Lebanon. What about the war in Lebanon? Because, uh, yes, the war in Gaza is still going on, uh, but uh, it has expanded. Uh, and now we see a war in Lebanon. Uh, do you know anything about what is going on there from a legal perspective? How can we make sense of what is going on there using international law? Yes, from an international law point of view, the analysis is essentially the same as the one we just went through. So you would have to okay. establish from Israel's point of view that they have the right to use force um, so that there was an armed attack, for example, and um, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon has attacked Israel consistently since um, since last year. Um, so, so there are armed attacks that could trigger this right to self-defense potentially. But then you have to apply it, as I said, with respect to each one of these missions. Yeah. To keep in mind, it needs to be necessary and proportionate. And you have to keep in mind, it cannot be punitive, it cannot be revenge. Mm. And it's only to a very limited extent that you can do it prospectively so that mm. you can attack in anticipation or in order to prevent a future attack from happening. That can be okay under some circumstances when there's relative immediacy, mm -hmm. but can ordinarily under international law not prospectively take out anyone who might potentially in the future attack you. Mm. Um, with respect to the humanitarian law questions, the use in Bello questions, it is very similar to what we see in Gaza. Um, that it is a highly factual question. Um, we have more observers in Lebanon, so there are more, um, it's easier to, to collect information and to determine whether there really was a Hezbollah command center uh, or if there were uh, Hezbollah fighters. Um, but those two will have to be answered on a, on an ad hoc basis. Hmm. Some things are easy, again, like attacking UN forces, um, that is not justifiable um, we, when we have enough facts to know that. And many states have come out and criticized Israel for uh, attacking the UN peacekeeping forces and entering the compound. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, with, with respect to the other ones, we, we would have to go through the same kind of uh, skeleton that we just went through. Mm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have one last question, actually, uh, before we end. And I'm very grateful for this talk. Uh, very clear, uh, very pedagogical. Um, what would you say to a hardcore realist saying that uh, international law is only applies uh, when it is in line with the interest of the great powers. It is very selective. It can uh, almost never really be enforced. It is of no use. Mm. Oh, there are many different claims now in that uh, <laughs> yeah. in one claim. Um, if we look at enforcement, international law can be enforced and is enforced. And most of it is enforced without problems um, in domestic laws, in regional courts, in international courts. But there are some areas of international law with respect to which it is the case um, that it very much looks as if states do whatever it is that they are doing um, or whatever suits them. And one of those areas is the law of war due to the high stakes that are involved um, and the hesitation of states to limit their freedom. At the same time, um, if you look at the history and the way in which wars are fought, I think you could argue uh, that 
the Geneva Conventions and the rules that states have agreed to comply with have led to a slightly more humane way of fighting, um, though it is and remains, of course, the case um, that war is extremely brutal and violent and that civilians pay the highest price for it and that states have not managed to protect civilians in a better way. Um, so I think that is my attempt to answer the question. International law, it works quite well. It provides at a minimum a language to discuss and debate and fight before courts, but it isn't perfect and we must um, keep trying to improve it and talk to our own governments and remind them of what it is. If, if we think that it is imperfect, I personally think it is imperfect. And I do remind my governments uh, that, that I have a connection with uh, of that and have the hope that we can fix the situation in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much for that uh, last uh, statement. Uh, and I hope, um, yes, uh, that hope will grow. Uh, although I am skeptical and perhaps a bit pessimistic myself. Uh, but again, uh, thank you very, very much, Valentin. Uh, it has been a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. Thank you very much, John, for the invitation.